Many years ago, Freeman Dyson told me what had attracted him to the idea of the Orion nuclear pulse propulsion scheme, 1958-59, at a time when most people were preoccupied with getting chemical boosters to work. He said, once you get past the stark lunacy of setting off a string of nuclear explosions right behind your spaceship, the rest is just good old mechanical engineering. I had known about the idea of the space elevator since 1966 and not given it another thought until reading Brad and Eric's book in early 2004. When I fell in love all over again and fell hard, it seemed so clear that if only the promise of carbon nanotubes pans out in an engineering material, the rest of it, well I won't say it's all just good old mechanical engineering, but it seemed so much easier a regime than the bleeding edge of rocketry. Then that summer, at the third Space Elevator Conference, Larry Bartosha, a mechanical engineer, uh, gave a presentation on a conceptual design for a mechanism to grip the roller and take the climbers up. It seemed like one of those easy things, you know, good old mechanical engineering, not screaming turbo pumps and, and pool wall combustion chambers. He said he had uh, assumed the rollers would be aluminum, to keep the weight down, and he calculated, I believe it was 63 million times an eight inch roller would turn on its way out to the far end. He said he'd gone looking for data, fatigue data on aluminum under this pressure and this many cycles. It did not exist. Nobody had ever asked aluminum to do that before. That presentation helped me begin questioning the idea in detail, uh, to get over my infatuation and take the space elevator seriously and you deserve credit for that. Infatuation is easy. The next step is harder. The more you dig into the details, the more tough questions like this one you encounter. Dozens of them, hundreds of them, and that is a good thing. We're here today because Brad worked very hard to turn a long-standing techno fantasy into something much more concrete and detailed and believable. You got a lot of people to fall in love with the idea and you attracted wide public notice, and I salute you for that. At the same time, between your enthusiasm and our common desire for better access to space, there is a risk of mistaking challenges that you showed to be soluble for challenges that are already solved. The space elevator needs advocacy, yes, but it also needs to be tested and tested down deeper into the details every day. In that spirit, Vern and I have brought together a panel with expertise on several of the toughest challenges. We have Vladimir Chivoto from Aerospace Corporation, Center on Orbital, Re uh, orbital and Reentry Debris Safety. Uh, this is Mr. Orbital Debris. I know that may sound disreputable, like, like he's a accompanied by a cloud of Agena fragments and paint chips. <laughs> if anyone deserves the title, let's see. Uh, we have Jordan Kerr, formerly of Los Alamos National Never Laboratories, now Kerr Technical Consultant. Never more, actually. Oh, Livermore. The, the Russians are the competition. Those warn warn me, Jeff. The enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Landis of NASA Glenn and MIT. are currently on leave from one to the other or the yep. other to the one. And science fiction author. Tom Nugent, Jr., the chief engineering officer of Liftport. And Stephen Patamia, formerly of Los Alamos <laughs> National Laboratory. And now a consultant. Our goal is summed up in this very familiar cartoon. <laughs> Jordan tells me I have a very small royalty to Sidney Harris. I, I see my good through PayPal. Who would like to? Uh, we have prepared short presentations. We kept the total well down for interaction. They are in no particular order. Uh, are you prepared to start? That would be an honor. 
out there in trouble time. Well, uh, let me reintroduce myself a little bit again. I'm known as, also as a Val Chopatov, Vladimir, not everybody can say even, but uh, I've been here in this business for many years. Val, I'll get to the mic. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, I do work for an organization called CORES. And uh, it stands for Center for Orbital and Reentry Debris Studies at the Aerospace Corporation. And it is a focal point for corporate research into space debris, satellite collision avoidance, reentry breakup, and related space hazards. That was written by my boss, so it's got to be right. Uh, I've been uh, asked to give you a, a sort of an overview of what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about orbital debris. And uh, this is what I'll try to do in a, perhaps 10 minutes time or something like that. Now, one definition of it, as you can see here, is uh, that it has two components. One of them is natural micrometeor environment, and the other one is strictly man-made. And you can see some of the differences between the two there. Now, the natural one is transient, and it's uh, moving in relatively high velocity relative to our space. On average, about 20 kilometers per second, but the maximum can be up to 100 kilometers per second, depending on how it's encountered, uh, how the particles from cometary uh, remnants are encountered. If it's head on, then it might be 100 kilometers per second. And notice that the, the, the sizes are quite small there. About 200 kilograms of total mass at any time within 2,000 kilometers of the Earth. Man-made debris, on the other hand, can be broken down into different categories, as we see there. And it is orbital, meaning it is uh, always around, uh, in, in orbit around the Earth. Uh, there's a separation in, in different sizes. Um, 10 centimeters is a convenient size because uh, radars normally cannot see sizes smaller than that. Uh, so we have a group of satellites that are 10 centimeters and larger and they're cataloged. And I'll say more about that later. Uh, there's also a lot of mass in orbit. Uh, and a certain amount of mass is shown here to be in some 3,000 inactive satellites. And then all the way down, uh, we come to the very small sizes, again, about 300 kilograms, uh, similar to the natural environment. So we're kind of matching the natural environment in the small size category. Now, there was a box score in March of 2004, and you can see who was actually contributing to the object that we have in space around the Earth. And you can, um, see the various uh, spacefaring nations, and also uh, the uh, amounts of payloads delivered and rocket body debris, and the totals. And the total there you can see is about 9,000 or so. That number does not seem to be changing uh, greatly, and it depends on solar activity and, and other factors. In fact, uh, we can see here the buildup of this environment, uh, catalog environment, uh, as a function of time beginning way back in 1960 and uh, all the way through 2005. And notice how uh, there was a linear buildup, but then it kind of leveled off and even started coming down. And there's some uh, dips even before that. And again, it's because of the solar cycle. Uh, the solar cycle tends to heat up the atmosphere and, and does bring in some of these uh, smaller particles quicker um, into the atmosphere where they burn up. Uh, here we see the uh, concentration of debris in, at certain altitudes, and what is shown is the spatial density. And you can see that the spatial density appears to be maximum at certain altitudes, in this case about um, maybe 800, um, 1,000 kilometers, and even at 1,500. Now there are various reasons why we see these peaks, primarily because everybody wanted to go to these altitudes, and, and there have been uh, breakups and explosions and even collisions in some cases. Uh, over here we also see uh, the major players and what they contributed to the tool. In this case the U.S. and also the former USSR, now Russia, of course. 
and you can see some of the others uh, are, are kind of uh, not as much contributing as these two primary contributors. Uh, we see uh, also the spatial density over a bigger range in altitude, and we see, of course, first the big peak on the left-hand side here, which um, is what we just were looking at, except it's covering uh, a bigger range. And then we see two smaller peaks, one here and one here. And that would be like the 12-hour uh, period orbit. That's where the GPS is located, and GLONASS would be located in that region, and that's where we see that peak. And that, of course, is geosynchronous. So we see a peak here, a peak there, and a peak here. And those are the primary hazard altitudes, so we would have to pay attention to those altitudes uh, for the space elevator. We also see that the mass in orbit is increasing uh, linearly, uh, and that is something to be concerned about. Uh, because eventually whatever goes up in orbit becomes jammed and will break up into smaller pieces and produce more fragments and more debris. Here we see uh, the launching uh, as a function of time. You notice that the launches have actually dropped off uh, lately, but the number of, um, or the mass, total mass going into orbit continues to increase. And here we see the distribution with inclination of these uh, objects, 9,000 objects that we've seen. And uh, these are the due east launches out of Kennedy. Uh, here we see some sun synchronous satellites, and most of that is former Soviet Union and now Russia, of course. The composition of, of this catalog debris, as you can see here, is almost half fragmentation, which says that there have been quite a number of explosions uh, which have contributed to half of that debris. And you see some of the other categories uh, also. And, and rocket bodies, some 17 percent, and active payloads only about 6 percent. How do we observe all of that? Well, we look at uh, the lower altitudes up to 5,000 uh, kilometers by radar. And, and above, it's usually optical. Uh, there are ways to look at it also from space. And, and this line here indicates that uh, observations have been made by a satellite called IRAS. <laughs> oh, it's too late. It's very sleepy. We'll have to hit the power key for the little bit. Power key. Okay. I'll tell you Okay. All right. Uh, I think uh, I don't want to exceed my allotted time here, but this would have been and is an example of LDAF that was a satellite that stayed in space for some six years and was recovered, and what we have learned from it. Uh, I can just quickly uh, run through some of these charts. Uh, here's the, in fact, uh, diagram for the satellite. Here's what it looked like, and uh, we see the commercial communication satellite in GEO, and uh, we see some of the things that uh, are important in geosynchronous orbit, as we see. I'll uh, come to this uh, chart here and just say a few words, because uh, that's really a, a very important chart. In a sense, it tells us uh, the cross-sectional flux that we have, meaning um, how many impacts per square meter per year uh, of a different size of particle are to be expected. And that goes, uh, does not have altitude in it, but just in general, uh, kind of average over all altitudes. And uh, various sources are indicated here. That's a NASA chart. What, what is important and interesting here is that uh, notice there is a bit of a discontinuity here where very large objects uh, are man-made uh, objects. Uh, that's the 9,000 uh, objects that we're talking about here. And, and this uh, dotted line here is the, uh, uh, you might call it uh, uh, the natural environment, the meteoroids. And of course, uh, everything else is also man-made. So uh, there was a gap in this region here for some time, and uh, 
a lot of uh, effort was made to try to fill that gap, to find out what that flux would be in this size range. And that size range is between one centimeter and 10 centimeters, mostly. Well, uh, the, the there is a certain radar called Haystack, uh, and that radar operated for about 10 years. And with it, uh, uh, this particular gap was filled. So now we have a continuous chart that uh, gives us this flux over all values of uh, size of these particles. Uh, I think I will pro probably just show you one more chart, and that's this one here. And that, again, is a NASA-generated chart. And, and notice that it has three types of curves in it. Business as usual, uh, business as usual for 20 years, then no more launches and no future launches. Well, that would be the ideal situation as far as the debris is concerned, of course. But if, if we uh, kind of ignore that one and say that business as usual, that would be something like that, which would indicate that there's going to be a lot of intercollisions of objects in space, which in turn will also generate uh, debris particles. Uh, how many have we had so far? Well, uh, there have been some documented and observed collisions in space, and there's about five of them that perhaps have uh, uh, occurred within the last five to ten years. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is the danger for the future again. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Yes. Going east with 10 kilometers coming west. And 
then you've got a 20 kilometer All right, per the, second. Uh, your encounter is very uh, high velocity to encounter, but the probability doesn't change. You still have the same number of encounters. It's the consequences that will be quite more disastrous in case one did have a collision. Um, could you perhaps give a couple words to mitigation? Yes. Uh, very important question. And uh, what is being done now is that, that space faring nations, and there is more than 10 of them that we meet uh, regularly on, on a yearly basis, have decided uh, that there are certain mitigation measures that need to be uh, implemented. What are they? Well, NASA has suggested that uh, satellites not stay in orbit more than 25 years. So every effort is being made to ensure that that is the case. How? By lowering the perigee. pursuing laser launch. Yes, I didn't, I didn't bring my Livermore Lab special laser pointer. <laughs> Let's see if this actually will wake up. The uh, title there, however, you can see, I'll talk about power beaming, uh, both for space elevators and a little bit for other things. The elevator power problem, I think people here are probably mostly familiar with. Uh, the question is, how do you drive something up a 30-odd thousand kilometer long cable? Uh, solar doesn't give you enough power, uh, so things go too slowly. Nuclear, you really don't want to have a nuclear reactor halfway up this thing and fall off. Chemical doesn't give you enough energy. Uh, extension cords, even very sophisticated superconducting extension cords are too heavy. Uh, and pretty much what you're left with is power beaming, uh, wireless extension cords. Good news is that works. Uh, there have been some demonstrations of laser power beaming. Um, the optics are probably not a problem. I'll be a little optimistic on some parts of this. Uh, it takes a reasonable sized telescope on the ground uh, to generate a spot that's a reasonable size to put on a climber. Uh, it's an easy problem compared to a lot of the other things that have been worked on for adaptive optics because the vehicle can help you and because you're pointing basically straight up. The lasers are clearly possible. That is, there are certainly designs out there. There's nothing in physics that says you can't build an appropriate laser. Um, and you have a minor advantage that the climber needs less power as it gets higher, which is nice for any kind of beam power thing because, you know, you don't worry if the losses start to grow a little bit as you get far away. On the other hand, if you want to power, if you want to catch something at the far end of the tether and haul it down to geosynchronous, you're in trouble. But we won't worry about that right now. The bad news is that there are no lasers that actually do all of the things that are needed for a space elevator power laser. Uh, there are megawatt class lasers. They run for a few seconds at a time, and they're the wrong wavelength. There are high beam quality lasers that are megawatt power, but they have those problems. Uh, many of the other lasers that would be good have lousy beam quality, uh, notably arrays of semiconductor diodes. 
You need a short wavelength if you want to receive the power on photovoltaics, which Jeff Landis will talk about. Um, and there aren't very many lasers that are at the right wavelengths. And the big one is you need a laser that runs for days. And there are no lasers bigger than uh, roughly 10 kilowatts, as opposed to a couple of megawatts that you want for a, a space elevator, that run for days. There just aren't any. Um, and of course, it has to be affordable on top of all that. This is the technology that Brad has, has cited, uh, free electron lasers. Uh, free electron lasers have a bunch of wonderful properties. They're tunable. They're in principle scalable to high power. In practice, they've been very slow to come along. This is the biggest free electron laser that's around. At the wavelengths we want, it puts out a kilowatt. If you go a little farther down in wavelength, it puts out 10 kilowatts. It costs $30 million to build, and it takes up the bottom half of that building at the bottom. Um, if you scale that up by a factor of 1,000 to space elevator scale, you can see what the cost would be. Um, there are people who have offered, claimed, said they could build bigger free electron lasers. But I refer you again to the quote at the bottom of that diagram. Um, none of those uh, activities have come to fruition. A lot of money has been spent trying to do them. Uh, it hasn't worked. The guy who built this has also worked on a fellow named Jean Cook, has also built several of the other biggest laser systems around. Uh, and his basic figure is if you want to build a megawatt laser, it's a billion dollars. If you want to build a megawatt laser that has all the other properties we need, the sky's the limit may be the wrong word to use around here. But. Uh, there is, however, good news. There's another technology which is brand new, which is just coming along, called diode pumped alkali lasers, which is compatible with beam powered photocells. It runs at the right wavelength. It uses laser diodes, which are the great, wonderful, marvelous source of high, high average power lasers. So you just you know, take DC power and cooling and put out light, and converts the light to a nice single high power beam. Uh, very efficiently, about 70% efficient, and looks like it'll scale to a couple of megawatts. Um, the difficulty, of course, is right now it's a couple of laboratory demonstrations putting out a few watts, but it's a nice, simple technology, and the nice thing about it is that's a, ten, a 100 kilowatt laser, and you can compare it to the previous one kilowatt laser. Um, it looks like it would be a very nice device. Um, and in fact, the existence of that uh, actually led me to put together a proposal with Jeff, among other people, about a year and a half ago uh, to beam power from the ground to a lunar base, uh, something which was also proposed using free electron lasers a decade or so ago and got nowhere because nobody would believe the lasers, among other things. Um, it actually looks like you could do that. It may be a reason to get NASA to fund building lasers, which would then be suitable for a space elevator as well. But it is still, you know, we're at what NASA would call TRL-1 or TRL-2, for those of you familiar with the technology readiness scale. Um, I just recently saw a nice uh, sort of internal plot of how you should scale the expected price of things relative to what you think they'll cost now versus the TRL. And the, the, the formula is basically um, uh, current TR, 6 minus the current TRL. Um, so you know, it works out to be um, about five times the current best estimate of the cost is what you should figure on for something at that level of readiness. I can't get up in front of a crowd and talk about car beaming without saying there's an alternative that I like that is different from the space elevator, has some different needs that get around some of this, which is beaming power to rockets instead of being that beaming power to climbers, uh, takes more laser power, takes 100 megawatts of laser power to get interesting instead of a, a megawatt or so. But it doesn't care what wavelength it is because it's just heating propellant. Um, and it doesn't need nearly the beam quality because it's only trying to reach out a few hundred miles instead of 22,000 miles. And that means you don't need one big laser, you can build a whole bunch of little lasers. And that means 
that instead of having to spend umpty ump million dollars trying to develop a multi-megawatt laser, uh, you get to spend a few million dollars developing a, a 10 kilowatt laser, and then you hand the blueprints to somebody and say, make me a lot of these. So the technical risk goes away a lot faster. And uh, people can argue with this, but this is my one comment on economics, which is that if you look at what it costs to get the risk out of the new technique, that is to get to the point where you can, in fact, hand a set of blueprints to somebody and say, build me more of these. Um, there's a lot of different technologies that start with you know, very simple rockets like the, the, the Falcon that SpaceX is building. They don't gain you much over current launch systems. You go up this uh, curve and things get more expensive and more technically risky to do. Um, Space Elevator, unfortunately, has the property that until you actually build one and put it up, the entire thing, you're not going to know whether it works or not because there's no real way to test the whole system. And you know, it's got so many different phenomena in so many different environments that I don't think anyone would say, yes, we have all the risk out of this until you've had one up there for a while. And so it has all the cost up front. Laser launch goes the other direction. It says all the hard stuff stays on the ground. You can do all the testing on the cheap. And only when everything is clearly working, you have to start cranking out the complete system. You could also argue about where that little red line on that chart for how much money is available goes. But that's kind of what most people have found. The challenges, I got asked specifically coming to this, what, you know, if I could start one of these uh, NASA challenges uh, or uh, you know, the, the competitions, what would I like to see for power beam? Well, part of it's already being done. You know, the, the ones that are being done of powering a climber, powering anything remotely with beamed energy is very good. You could also do a contest that says, don't ask people to build a laser. Don't ask them to handle high power. Those are both hard things. But see if they can do the quality part of it. See if, you, if they can take a low power laser, enough to be interesting, 100 watts, say, and send it a long distance. And that gets you in and track a moving target for the second round. And that gets you into innovations in optics, innovations in receivers, innovations in tracking systems, which are a big cost in the people who have tried to do, for instance, weapons lasers. And those are things which small groups can work on a lot easier than they can work on building better lasers. And that's it. Uh, I just want to say, personally, I am shocked. shocked. I'm such a deep person that work in Elmer, and I think the, the charities that they want for Boy Scout troops to give them. Uh, I'd like to have if, uh, uh, just a few questions now and then move on. If you like, we'll continue to build and then we'll, we'll, we'll go to full panel after we've had at least one more presentation. Are there questions for Jordan? Real quick. Yes, the laser just sitting on the ground. They take up about a golf course worth of space somewhere in New Mexico.
have the same launch capacity, it would be in smaller pieces. If you, if you wanted to launch, uh, you know, 10, 10 payloads at a time, the thing about the laser launch is it launches a payload every 15 minutes, not every week. Yes. Yes. In fact, I was just at a meeting where there's another big graph I show where I show that same a miracle, you know, now a miracle has to happen. Um, and I show that, and then the next slide is, and by the way, the last two years, three different people have presented me with miracles. <laughs> there's no more miracles whatsoever in the laser launch. There's, there really is just straightforward engineering and finding somebody willing to pay for it. The, both the DPAL and the laser, I have to refer over the DPAL for the uh, laser launch scheme, which is uh, diagonal fiber lasers, are very efficient. They are currently about 25%, fiber lasers are currently 25 to 30% wall plug to light out. Uh, there's work being done by DARPA to improve the efficiency of the diodes and lots of other people working on improving efficiency. The number we used in a recent paper Comparing microwaves to lasers uh, was that the laser systems will be between 40 and 50 percent efficient, wall plug power to light. So lasers have come a long way from you know argon ion lasers, which have an efficiency of zero in this one direction. And I think I should sit down. And I'll be around for a little while afterwards too. So. Now, somebody who doesn't just want to fry in offending launch vehicles, but wants to do something useful at the receiving end, very glad it's Well, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about some of the other things that one can do with lasers in terms of sending lasers to photovoltaics. And it actually sort of is a trip down memory lane because I've been looking for applications for power beaming. In fact, and to some extent, my fascination with trying to beam power has been looking for an application that would be a stepping stone to satellite solar power systems where you have to beam power from the sky to the ground that cost less than several hundred billion dollars for the first watt on the ground. One of the ideas that I started proposing around 1989 was the idea that if you do have a moon base, it turns out a moon base is very difficult to power by solar power. Solar is great because it's cheap. The sun is shining, you get the power coming down from the sky. Unfortunately, the moon has a 354 hour night, which is a very long time to operate on batteries. Even the Energizer Bunny gets pretty tired after a couple of hundred hours operating. So my proposal for the late and lamented space exploration initiative was it's easy enough, we have plenty of power on the Earth, we'll just send the power from the Earth to the Moon uh, with a number of laser sites on the ground. And in fact, here is an artist conception that was made from one of my proposals, and that's the uh, laser spot. And you can see the spot, that little dot on the Earth that's beaming a laser to a solar array on the Moon. That spot doesn't look very bright because you're standing outside of the beam. Uh, if you were standing in the beam, it would be much brighter, except hopefully your visor has a laser rejection uh, filter on it, or else that will be the brightest thing that you will ever see. Uh, Do not look into laser with yes. remaining eyeball. So uh, well, I went on from that and was starting to look at other possibilities. In fact, this got picked up by NASA when John Rather independently reinvented it about six months later and turned it into a large uh, project. But here's the Selene concept, uh, where it said, well, we can do other things. And one of the things we can do on it is beam power to satellites so that we can get more power to the satellite than just what you can get from the sun. And in fact, we took that a little bit further and said, well, uh, when do you need power on a satellite? You need a power on a satellite during the eclipse, which is for a period of up to about 69 minutes during the equinox period when the satellite enters into uh, the Earth's shadow. In fact, we said something we can do is actually we can save satellites whose batteries have failed that are otherwise perfectly good satellites, and we can save them 
by powering them during eclipse. And we looked at that, and it actually seemed like it was on the edge of being a feasible money-making alternative. We could actually make money on old satellites, uh, except for the problem that this part down in the ground, all of this part, was a several billion dollar initial investment. And if we had a couple of billion dollars, we could make money. But we <laughs> didn't have somebody sitting around with a couple of billion dollars in their pocket saying, what shall I invest in? What shall I invest in? That was before the dot-com doing. Don't kill the trip. They're going to be bad already. So, well, actually, it's possible some of you may have a couple of billion dollars. And if you do, come see me. Uh, I can help you with that problem. Uh, so here's a, just sort of a summary of the several different applications that we thought we might be able to do with laser beam power. The moon base, unfortunately, disappeared relatively rapidly. They weren't planning a moon base anymore after about uh, 1990. Uh, we have the application of beaming to satellites and another application of beaming to orbital transfer vehicles. Another case we're looking for, what is a real world market? What are people paying to do? And in fact, they're paying to lift satellites from low Earth orbit to geosynchronous orbit because you can boost them to low Earth orbit and you want them in geosynchronous orbit. So we will have an electric propulsion tug that takes them from point A to point B. And what we did is we made a tug that used both the sun and laser power so that we could get there a little bit faster and time is money. So we can, again, pay for the uh, development of the laser with a real world market. Unfortunately, we couldn't find somebody with a couple of billion dollars to build the laser uh, on the ground. We did do some testing. In fact, Jordan was here uh, at Livermore when we did this testing. We tested some solar cells uh, with what was at the time the highest power continuous wave laser in the world, the Atlas laser at Livermore. And this is just a nice publicity still of one of the times when they shot the Atlas laser into the sky. In this particular case, you can see it's a yellow laser beam, which they did with a dye converter from the original sort of uh, green color of it. Uh, in this case, it's looking to make an artificial guide star to uh, focus the uh, adaptive optic telescopes. So this is being shine. Uh, get back there. They're shining this up to the sodium D level and making the sodium in the upper atmosphere fluoresce. Uh, pretty cool uh, laser. Uh, big building. Uh, lots of power running the running the laser there. I'll give me another. Uh, Another slide. Okay. So uh, I was actually sort of amused when they picked up the idea of laser power beaming for the space elevator. And here's a, a graph of the space elevator. But as mentioned, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Your space elevator system has to be ultimately lightweight because the less weight you have, the, uh, the faster you can go and the more you can climb with. So the idea of using this idea for the climbing power is just absolutely a, a great idea, a superb idea. And there's just another one of these publicity pictures now showing the climber with a laser beam from the ground uh, oh, come on. That picture. shining up uh, to the solar panel on the laser. Uh, on the, the climber. And this thing really does not want to move to the next slide. Yeah, I'm trying not to, but it wants to go there whether I want to go or not. So this is sort of the fundamental formula uh, that you need to look at for photovoltaic conversion of laser energy. In fact, nature is on your side. Solar cells would rather convert monochromatic photons than the solar spectrum. The solar spectrum is a broad range spectrum uh, with photons of every energy. If you can tune the solar cells to one particular wavelength, you get much better efficiency. So here's some numbers for gallium arsenide solar cells, uh, indium phosphide solar cells, a little bit longer wavelength, and just some uh, basically measured efficiency numbers for solar cells being used as laser voltaic devices. And when you look at them, they're about double the efficiency that you get 
uh, on the ground. Here's solar cells, gallium arsenide solar cells, over 50% efficient. The best gallium arsenide solar cells for solar conversion are more like 24%. So you're doubling the, the conversion efficiency just by tailoring it to a single band. But one other thing that you note is that you really do have to pick the solar cell for the wavelength. So here's gallium arsenide. A solar cell is characterized by a cutoff wavelength and it has zero conversion efficiency for wavelengths longer than that cutoff. So you want to pick the uh, efficiency, then it linearly drops below the, for wavelengths below the cutoff, immediately drops above the cutoff. So you want to be right about at the cutoff. So for gallium arsenide cells, that's about 860, uh, maybe 870 nanometers. Uh, you can pick your solar cells longer, but the longer wavelength you go, in fact, the worse the solar cells get. So that's one thing to think about. You tune your solar cell to the laser, and for infrared lasers, you get worse efficiency. The more you climb up toward the visible, the better efficiency you get. In fact, in some tests out at NASA Ames, they started using gallium indium phosphide solar cells, even better efficiencies uh, with the shorter wavelengths. Another problem, however, is solar cells don't like to work hot. So as you put a beam intensity that's higher and higher on the target, the solar cells heat up until, in fact, somewhere here, uh, this is about 12 times one sun intensity, you actually get less power out of your solar cell uh, with the laser as you crank the power up. So you put more power in, get less power out. And uh, if you look at it, you're running at about half efficiency when you get uh, up here at the very high power ranges. This is one particular calculation. This one, I believe, was for a uh, gallium arsenide solar cell on the moon. The difference between day and night is in the daytime, you also have the sun shining on it, heating it up, and that heats it up just a little bit. Uh, whereas at nighttime, it's running a little bit cooler. You rather have the laser than the sun because the laser gives you more power. So at the same uh, dense intensity, you're getting a little bit more power at night. So that's another thing to think of. You can't cram the power up as much as you want because if you put too much power on, you're going to heat it up and lose power output. Uh, nature is kind to you in that the shorter wavelength you go, not only are the solar cells more efficient, but also they are less responsive to temperature, which means they degrade less high with temperature. Unfortunately, beyond about uh, two electron volts, or maybe a little bit more, two and a half electron volts, that is about half a micron wavelength, we just don't have the materials for solar cells. So uh, you can't go all the way up to ultraviolet photons. We don't have good ultraviolet converters. <laughs> While I'm talking about lasers and cool things that you can do with them, I should really go back to really my first love, what I really want to do. You know, I want to go into Earth orbit, to go to Mars, settle the solar system, go visit Pluto, uh, put some colonies in the atmosphere of Venus. These are all cool things. But what I really think we should do is go out into interstellar space and stop hanging around in the neighborhood. Uh, and lasers are possibly a way for us to get out of the neighborhood and really into this larger galaxy in which we live. Uh, just one of many shots. Uh, one of the things I've sort of worked on is how can you use a laser beam to push a light sail uh, to get at high velocity to really start making a interstellar mission. And uh, it is a long range project. It's hard to do, but it is one of the few ways that you can get around the difficulty of mass ratio for an interstellar mission. Uh, here's another proposal. This is a laser ram rocket interstellar proposal where you gather in interstellar medium, which is rather tenuous, and heat it with a laser and shoot it out the back. So this is, in fact, a rocket engine, but it's a rocket engine that is self-refueling. Uh, the only reason I happen to show this is that they had a uh, exhibit at the Boston Museum of Science uh, that has this model and said, oh, that's really cool. It's the laser uh, ram rocket interstellar propuls uh, propulsion system. Uh, oh, yeah. So that uh, was sort of a quick introduction to lasers. One other thing that has 
somewhat fascinated me and I think might be a, a thing worth thinking about in incorporating into uh, tether and space elevator thought is the fact that a space elevator is conventionally a structure in tension. It's a string and you pull on it, it has no compressive strength. It turns out when you do the analysis, it makes sense for the lowest part of it, in fact, to be a structure in compression. So if instead of having a uh, space tether that goes all the way out to geosynchronous orbit, if the lowest part that gets you out of the atmosphere is a compressive structure, a tower, you can actually do a little bit better. Uh, and in fact, the currently envisioned plans for space elevators are probably unworkable because the hard part, that is the part that's farthest away from the end of the string, the part that uh, really is weighing on the whole tether for the 40,000 kilometer length, uh, is in the Earth's atmosphere and is subject to the worst forces, subject to humidity, uh, et cetera. It works much better if instead you build a tower up from the surface. What's interesting to note is that the height of skyscrapers on the Earth is not limited by material properties. You could build skyscrapers much higher, including this 15 kilometer one, which is relatively low. Stop doing that. Uh, you could build uh, many kilometer high uh, towers if you wanted to. And here's one. An interesting thing to note about this particular visualization uh, is that this is a truss structure, and each of the trusses is in fact made of a truss. So it's what you call a, a fractal truss structure, which is a pretty cool uh, concept, but in fact it's used all the time. There's a picture that I took just shows a, a fractal truss where the elements of the truss are uh, themselves trusses. And it would be relatively easy to build a tower uh, that goes, extends outside of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, that could be, in fact, if you wanted to, even up to several hundreds of kilometers tall. Uh, so that's something to think Just about. Just mechanical engineering. It, it is merely mechanical engineering and, uh, and the will to do it. So, uh, another concept. Uh, you can make cost projections based on skyscrapers, and it's not cheap. Uh, but on the other hand, you probably don't need the windows and the offices and you know a lot of the stuff that does make uh, make skyscrapers cheap. Wouldn't it make more sense to scale it from radio towers? Yeah, actually, it probably would. The tallest. You, you, you pay for it with the revolving restaurant. <laughs> Climbing at 
Uh, where, where in the chamber? Delivered? Uh, drive home? Yeah, the whole, the whole thing, yeah, two megawatts uh, engine power. So you have to deliver six megawatts. Um, You'd probably be running the solar cells at somewhere around a kilowatt per square meter hour of power. Um, because any higher, you're going to be losing, losing power output. So you're going to be putting many suns on. So a kilowatt per square meter uh, megawatt of power is a thousand square meters.
laser launch system, how to do it with smaller lasers somehow combined together, uh, because the chances of getting someone to build yet another megawatt class laser with the properties you need is really slim. With that said, I would love to say that the space elevator is one of the few concept, concepts that really is eminently uh, suitable for useful, economically important uh, small-scale demonstrations because the space elevator doesn't have to be from geosynchronous to the surface of the Earth. A space elevator is the ultimate evolution of tether systems, and there are tether systems that can make a lot of money, especially if you have nanotubes uh, that have multi-gigapascal of uh, great strength. You can do some really spectacularly useful things with tethers that are near 50 or 100 kilometers long and don't have to be 100,000. So there are portable transfer there services are portable to be performed. You can start which people pay a lot of money. You can start opening up the Earth to Geo and the Earth to Mars and the Moon system and blow away the cost of existing transport systems uh, with tethers. So you know it's a great system for scaling up for small sizes. We should probably move to the next one or you won't have any time to talk. So well, let me just chime in this real quickly about this. I want something very well clarified here. I don't disagree at all with the notion of Earth terrorism. Um, but you have to be very careful. The, the space elevator is a segmentable problem in the sense that you spend a lot of time, two of you now, talking about lasers in particular. So if you want a bigger laser, then you have to find some terrorist approach to getting one. But that is a process that can be independent of your goal of using it for the space elevator application. Similarly, as it was just pointed out, that, that there are things you can do with, with better tether technology, although there's a lot more problems in the implementation of that. It's a little harder for you to conceive of comparison up to that. Nevertheless, it's, it's a segment of the space elevator problem. It's not the whole space elevator problem. So while it's true that a space elevator is going to make a dime for the whole thing's working, it is not true that in order to justify the, the development of the components of it, you have to tear us the entire project, which is not feasible. So there is an important yeah, exactly. You find niches for all of the pieces you need and so build the pieces up. This, this can yeah. you in a way that defines the strategy. The flip side of that, unfortunately, is that the difference between, for instance, a rotating tether in space that's 100 kilometers long, or even something that hangs down and stops 1,000 kilometers above the top of the atmosphere, um, and a tether that actually goes all the way to the ground is very large. Yeah. The, the, the last step from all of the other subsystems being somewhere in the right ballpark of what you wanted and an integrated operating elevator is a very large one. I think that would be a good note on which to move to our, our panelists and with a, a handful of people and a fistful, a small fistful of dollars is actually going to start terracing some of these. So, Another cheerful <laughs> I uh, I was at a uh, dinner a few days ago and I was telling someone about the space elevator. Some of the challenges and questions that are going. At first he, he asked me, so are you for or against it? <laughs> and I realized, given how I talk and approach the problem, I may be the, most, the person most pessimistic about the space elevator who still believes it can be done. So I'm going to talk <laughs> about building it. Now, as everyone said here, this is a large scale project. Cross country railroads, Great Wall of China, pyramids are not as big as a space elevator. The amount of engineering that's going to go into this is huge. And while the materials are, in a sense, the biggest obstacle, there are still a lot of other questions that need to be answered. that can start to be answered before we even have the material to build it. So let me run through a list of scary questions. And some of these I'm not going to go into any detail on. I could spend a long time talking about any one of these. Lightning. Even if you're in the most ideal location that has very few lightning strikes, it's not zero. You have to deal with somehow uh, protecting your ribbon from it, maybe shielding it, draining electrons out of the atmosphere, who knows. Wind, you're going to not only be causing a high static load, in the tether by, by deforming from wind, you're also going to be causing the, the ribbon to flap around, 
which could actually be more damaging than the, the, the single direction of the wind. Um, twist in the ribbon. Uh, as the ribbon twists back and forth, you may wind up inducing more stresses uh, on the ribbon. Precipitation. You're going to have condensation on your ribbon. You're going to have things starting to, your water starting to freeze at the right altitude on your ribbon. So not only is that going to add weight, but it's going to change your conductive path for the lightning question. Uh, atomic oxygen, as we talked about before, it will slowly erode uh, your carbon nanotubes. Um, talked about putting some uh, metallic uh, thin film on your material, but that adds weight, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, orbital debris was already talked about. Uh, deployment, uh, Dave Lang gave his talk yesterday about deployment. Uh, deploying the thing alone is very difficult. Um, doing things such as avoiding orbital debris during deployment is something that no one has, has talked about at all and has no idea how to handle. And then uh, Jordan and Jeff have talked about all the issues with power beaming. Um, elastic energy. Uh, Freeman Dyson raised this issue a couple of years ago and no one has really uh, gotten too deep into it. When you have stretched uh, your, your ribbon to 5 or 10 percent of its uh, strain, you're going to have a lot of elastic energy stored in what is effectively a big spring. You have a whole bunch of little threads in your ribbon. Medi micrometeorite comes along and breaks one of those. All that energy now gets released. Does that then start breaking nearby ribbons and cause cascading failure? We don't know. Um, for comparison, this is not perhaps the best way to look at it, but I did a calculation a little while ago. Uh, the energy per unit weight stored in a uh, uh, space elevator ribbon is, uh, I believe the number was, on the order of a kilojoule per kilogram. For comparison, gasoline is 45 <laughs> kilojoules that, per kilogram. That number is cheating because you don't count the mass of the oxygen. Gasoline plus oxygen stores about five kilogram, uh, megajoules per kilogram. Okay. So you're basically, the, the stretch tether is in the same category as gunpowder. It's a little lower than DNA. I, I thought it was actually very close to lead acid battery. Um, safety factor. All of the analysis done so far talks about having a safety factor of two. Uh, I've talked with, you know, I have the joke up here with the, the, from the matrix of them shooting the cable out of the elevator. But you talk with uh, structural engineers and uh, I talked with one guy who builds skyscrapers. When you're talking about the static load on a wall, you can use a safety factor of two. When you're talking about the cables that are used in an elevator system, which admittedly are somewhat different from what we're talking about, but objects that have dynamic loads on them, there they use a safety factor of five. If you have to use a safety factor of five on a space elevator ribbon, you're not going to build it. You're, the strength that you need was going to be way too high. Uh, then we get to the thermal issues. The, the, gra the item there shows the space elevator in different orientations in the magnetosphere and in the Earth's shadow. It's going to be going partly in the shadow, totally in the shadow, facing the sun, and that's going to be changing the temperature of different parts of the ribbon by perhaps a couple hundred degrees in a few minutes. Also, the ribbon is going to be, as I mentioned before, twisting. Sometimes it's going to be face on to the sun, sometimes it's going to be edge on. So you're going to have a very complicated thermal environment for the ribbon, which is not only going to mean that it sort of expands and contracts, but if you're talking about a composite material, it's going to cause uh, thermal fatigue and your, your nanotubes are going to be pulling out of their matrix material. And then you have the, the, the elevator poking out of the magnetosphere, and that's going to induce some current, which is going to further add to heating. Now we talk about the vehicle. We have, as uh, Monty said when he was uh, introducing, Larry Batoshek looked at aluminum for doing uh, rolling wheels for 62,000 miles. Uh, and that's an endurance problem that no one has actually solved. So trying to get a vehicle that can climb 62,000 miles through varying regimes, you know, through the atmosphere, through vacuum, through the Van Allen radiation belts, et cetera, et cetera, uh, without an oil change, without a gas stop, without any maintenance, is going to be a huge engineering challenge. Uh, and again, you have to deal with uh, radiating away the, the heat. And then I can talk about more and more issues. Uh, radiation damage. Again, you have this ribbon under a great amount of tension when some cosmic ray comes along and perhaps uh, breaks a bond, you have a lot of energy in that bond. Does that then cause more damage? Um, your ribbon is going to be slowly sandblasted by the very, very small micrometeorites. You're going to need to constantly inspect the state of the ribbon um, it's going to be sort of hard to take a scanning electron microscope and run it along 100,000 kilometers and look at the microstructure of your ribbon. 
um, you have to monitor the position so, so you can do it. Like <laughs> <laughs> everybody's computer. That's right, that's right. Um, you have to, as we talked about, you can't really test this thing until you've deployed the first one. But there's going to be a lot of smaller scale testing in terms of putting a balloon up to 100,000 feet, dropping a ribbon from it, and climbing, doing stuff like that. Doing 1,000 kilometer long tethers in orbit, doing power beaming experiments. There's a lot of uh, testing and, and development you have to do before you develop the final thing. Um, damage, how fast can you accelerate? Uh, alternate designs, rather than the compression uh, tower that Jeff mentioned, some people have talked about putting a giant balloon platform above most of the atmosphere and anchoring your ribbon there. So these are just, these are, this isn't even the full list. Uh, this, is, this is a lot of the big questions though that face the space elevator. Um, so the question that uh, Monty asked me to talk about today is, can you get some sort of sense of an answer to these questions before you need you know, hundreds of millions or tens of millions of dollars of funding? Uh, and I think that the answer is yes. Uh, and, and there's some different routes that we take to this. One is uh, piggybacking on other research. There are a lot of people who are interested in orbital debris. So there's a lot of research on mitigation and tracking and whatnot that we can benefit from other people's work. Um, things like space tethers, the laser launch, other types of propulsion systems will have common interest in some of these topics. Uh, the laser launch will help us work on power beaming, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one answer for getting some useful funding is, for example, uh, weather modeling. Right now, if you want to look at the uh, do, do measurements in the upper atmosphere, you generally have to shoot a rocket through there or have a balloon that drifts along. You don't have something that sits up at 10 miles or 5 miles and sits in the same spot taking measurements. If you could have a nice balloon platform that went up 10, 15 miles, hung a ribbon from it, you could have science being taken off that and it'd be useful for NOAA. So you might be able to get some funding and some research working there. Um, volunteers. Uh, you know, Brad said before that there's been about a million dollars spent on space elevator research. Uh, more than half of that was his NIAC study. Most people who are working on this are doing it in adjunct with their regular jobs or volunteers or spending other time working on it. Uh, and there's a lot of people, you know, at Liftport, we've gotten a lot of emails from a lot of people saying, oh, this is a really great project, I'm interested, how can I help? So there's a, lot, a wide variety of people out there, admittedly of quite the range of skill levels, but you get, you know, some retired military engineers or whatever who say, yeah, I'm interested, I want to work on this. Um, and we started talking with people at a bunch of different universities for collaborating on some of these research projects. You know, there's a guy who does radiation damage for, I'm not sure what the application is, maybe it's nuclear reactors or something, but he was talking with me about space elevator and said, you know, okay, how can I maybe do some research that's also relevant, you know, to my research. Uh, and then eventually you can start spending some big money on some real live uh, major detailed engineering support. So one of the things to figure out is, is which questions do you want to tackle? Uh, and I threw together this, this vague hand-waving diagram here. These which, are all movable. Yeah, these are all movable. Every, every, every single person in this room is going to have a different opinion about what this graph should look like. Um, but you can talk about what's the impact of answering some questions at varying level details versus how much work do you have to do? You know, on the left-hand scale, I say it's just engineering. And by that, I mean, um, things that you can sit down in your home and, and do some computer modeling, say. You can draw stuff on paper and get some answer. You know, the, the ribbon dynamics is something that, you know, Dave Lang has done some work on, you can do a lot more on, and that does not require you to build a superconducting super collider. You know, it's something that you can do with computing. At the other end, you know, radiation damage, you need to build an accelerator and do a study, but radiation damage to the ribbon might be something that's relatively low attrition rate, it simply affects the lifetime of your ribbon, the relative impact is lower. Uh, the elastic energy question is something that's going to be partially dependent on your final material, so in that sense, I've, I've pushed it farther to the right because you need to start developing a macro scale nanotube uh, material before you can do some testing, and that's a high impact because that's one of the potential showstoppers. So we sort of look at this and so we want to, to look at the relatively high impact, relatively easier questions to try and tackle first. So, so the, the road license is a showstopper potential. Yeah, well, showstopper fair? potential or other importance. You know, ribbon control 
One thing is modeling the ribbon dynamics. So what's it going to look like? The inverse of that is to say, okay, we know that uh, there's this bit of debris that's going to hit us in 12 hours. What do we have to do to avoid it? You know, that, that's going to be a large modeling problem. Um, and, but it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's another important question. So as I said, I sort of threw this together. I might change the positions. And there's levels of detail. Ribbon dynamics encompasses a lot. There's transverse, axial, torsional oscillations. There's a whole bunch of other issues that you could break this up into a bunch of simple uh, subcategories. Anyway, so at Liftport, like I said, we've been trying to partner with people. There are you know, professors, research staff, students who are at you know, these institutions and others who we've worked with in varying levels. We're having some interns come out uh, this summer to work on some of these questions and try to assemble the list of questions into a, a document that is readable and useful for people across the research uh, industry, I guess you could say, to, to see if there's something that they can do. Um, occasionally people come to us and say, hey, I'm a grad student, I want a research topic that's for my thesis that's relevant, can you give me some guidance? Um, and if you're interested in doing some research, come talk to me afterwards and I'd be happy to uh, point you in the right direction. <laughs> so uh, that's all. Uh, if you can find out more at Liftport, there's, you know, we have forums of people who are uh, varying levels of skill. I hear that the signal to noise ratio is a little higher than on the Yahoo group. Um, and uh, you know, tell the people who are in researchers who might want to get interested to uh, come talk to us. Any? <laughs> Questions or should I? Well, Jeff said uh, the, the Skyhawk, the Beanstalk, our, the Lifeboard Space Elevator, the Red Edward Space Elevator, is a subset of momentum exchange devices in general. And you said uh, that building a facility and doing the radiation exposure on your sample material, well, there is a facility up there full-time, 24-7. Uh, if people are going to have tethers up there for their own reasons anyway, possibly a power-beamed reboosting tether that simply does LEO to GEO, just, just does an orbital staircase function. It might as well be made of whatever your state-of-the-art material is by then. That's true. Well, but they this might not want to by, because... By piggybacking and yeah, building constituents. There, there's a question of... If you haven't answered the question about atomic oxygen, depending on how high up you are, someone say, I'm not going to fly that ribbon that's going to get eaten away at however many millimeters per year because of the atomic oxygen environment. I'm going to use a safer material. Well, uh, except that very likely the initial applications are going to be disposable tethers. Uh, so you might as well use your great material, okay. and you're using it for an application that needs an hour. And then, interestingly enough, you can look at it and see how it worked and say, hey, Okay, how to do? Oh, well, he's so going to be cranking it up a kilometer then, so that's not that's not. <laughs>
I had uh, two central questions. Uh, one, uh, how well do carbon nanotubes burn? Or, I mean, because you know, there have been I studies. They burn about 600 centigrade, but they need I mean, there have been interesting studies from RPI. You know, I mean, well, if you increase, you know, I mean, if you increase the surface area of carbon nanotubes to a certain degree, like you might have a frame, you know, you can get some rather rapid burning sometimes of carbon nanotubes. Uh, Second question is. See uh, what happens if you light steel wool. Think of that yeah, multiplied exactly. by the ratio of uh, exactly. fiber with this. Exactly. Uh, uh, well, okay. let's, we, we really need to uh, oh, come in. Okay. You want to see the, sorry, earlier. Yeah, I was just going to say. Well, the good news is, <laughs> I can be fairly brief to this one, and I don't need a single slide. In fact, I'm even at can I use that? Does it work? Is my voice not strong enough? All right. I will happily do this. All right. Look, you know, uh, I got involved in this, I think, primarily because of the interaction between things that I do, which I'll describe momentarily, and the debris problem and the avoidance of debris and that sort of thing. And what I do uh, is I do uh, large scale forces, an analysis of large-scale forces and the response of the ribbon to it. And of course, the ribbon in this case is, is defined in a distinct way to be uh, Brad Edwards' ribbon design. So discussions of alternatives and so forth are interesting, but not, not helpful to me at this particular point. And what I discovered in the process is what I intuitively expected when I got involved with this, which is that the ribbon is so damn big, anything moves it. A very simple takeaway thought. Now let me quantify it briefly for you, for those of you who haven't seen any of the talks that I've given. Um, solar radiation pressure, not to be confused with solar wind, but the, just the pressure of photons of all frequencies coming from the sun and hitting the ribbon. It'll move it. How much? Well, for something uh, about the size of ribbon to lift a 20-ton climber, it'll you know, stretch it out about uh, 70 kilometers or so. And then, you know, it swings back and forth about three times a day, and, and it has a complicated uh, thing, which I could show you pictures of, but it's just distracting. You know, it, it moves it. What about if a magnetospheric storm kicks off? Well, it turns out that that'll move it because the electric field will change in the uh, space surrounding the Earth. That'll, couple, that'll put a current in the wire. That'll couple to the magnetic field that's going around with the Earth. That'll put a force on it and moves it. How much? Well, it uh, depends on the size of the storm. If it's a really big storm and if the, the uh, conducting rate is very high, maybe on the order of you know, 40, 50 kilometers. Now, there's an ex a, a interesting and important distinction between those two cases, and there's plenty of cases you can think of, like the moon, for example, you know, the tidal forces. In the one case, the solar radiation pressure is putting in a pretty much of a standing pattern. You could, if you, once you get the parameters of the uh, ribbon pinned down, or you actually put it up so you can measure it, uh, you can predict with considerable accuracy you know, what it's going to do. There are many complications for, for that you know, with, with the uh, changing seasons and so forth. I won't go into them, but in principle, it can be done. So it doesn't impact seriously your ability to say, where is the ribbon now? And why do I care? By contrast, things like the solar storm and things like climber activity, which are very ad hoc, you know, climbers stopping suddenly because of some malfunction, then getting caught in some big swing, slowing down, speeding up, starting, I mean, it just goes on forever. All these things tend to induce wave systems that travel. You know, they reflect from the top and the bottom and back and forth. Now, both of these effects have some impact on your ability to do things like predict where the ribbon's going to be relative to some possible impact from something else. So it induces an uncertainty. But consider this. With respect to the standing waves, all it does is slowly move it on the, on the scale that you're interested in. It doesn't really change the impact uh, probability very much at all. What it does do is it complicates your life horribly if you're planning to move the thing around to avoid anything. And there are two aspects to that. One is the general background you know, difficulty of just you know, looking at not just a ribbon in a single place, but a whole pattern of ribbon movement you know, and the envelope around it. That's a complication. Um, the second thing it does is it complicates terribly your ability to absorb energy out of the ribbon to dampen it in any way so that you can stabilize it, so you can you know, precisely uh, reposition it. There are so many details that the devil has thrown up here that we all could go on forever. Let me toss in one in this, this regime that I've been talking about. There is this 
fantasy. <laughs> that, that if you see something coming, you know, if NORAD calls you up and says, ah, you know, you got something coming at you at a certain altitude, inclination, you know, and it'll be here in, in two hours. You know, move the ribbon because, you know, you're too close. And of course, you want to move the ribbon if it's that close. How close is that? Nobody has ever told me how close that really should be. But let's so assume that somebody you know, has agreed on this. All right, how do you do that? Well, the only way anybody knows at the moment, and the way that's in you know, Brad's book and so forth, is you, you make your platform on the bottom movable. So the idea is very simple. You, know, you say, oh, okay, well, we, we, we just move it. And when we move it, a kink goes up. And that kink, as it goes up, you know, at, at something like uh, uh, 4,000 uh, meters per second, you know, that kink will displace. And when it gets to just the right spot at just the right time, it will have displaced everything so that that piece of debris we were worried about just zooms on by. Have you ever thought about how hard that really is? <laughs> I mean, the, you know, Philip Anderson, a uh, famous uh, condensed matter theorist at, um, at Princeton, you know, he said of, of uh, condensed matter problems, he says, you know, more is different. <laughs> Things behave differently when they get bigger. You have emergent phenomena. Actually, it turns out that small is pretty different too. But the point is that changes in scale, if you don't think about them seriously, fool you into believing you understand the problem. Something Philip Anderson would have said. I mean, he'd be proud of the statement. And the fact is, again, the elevator is so damn big. And if you think you really understand how it's going to behave under all the circumstances dynamically that we can conjure up, you're kidding yourself. There will be aspects of it that will be strongly predictable, to be sure. But there are many, many important details of it that will absolutely defy you. Continued example. Wave is coming down. And by the way, you could conceivably, you know, you could put a laser beam on it, you could put instruments on it, you could, you could at least see things coming. And if the biggest issue, and it's not the only issue to be sure, but if the biggest issue were, you know, things in the Leo range, and we've already seen diagrams which you know, it would be pointless for me to reproduce, you know, where you've got some big peaks of concentration of debris in the Leo range. So if you're worried about that. So if you could look up and see some wave pattern, some traveling wave pattern moving down towards you, Okay, and you could, you could map it out with great precision. Then you would have a better shot at doing one of two things. Either adjusting your maneuvers around that, taking it into account, or damping out that energy. Okay? I've talked about difficulties moving the ribbon. Let me, let me make one point about that. If you look at some of the things that, that I have calculated as far as motion of the ribbon, you project them down to this low level. What you find is it's starting at about um, Two, uh, two kilometers up, the, the magnitude of just routine motions that you can expect is something like six kilometers, and it goes down linearly from there. So, you know, it doesn't look too bad at first glance. You know. The problem is that, that that supposition does not include in the least um, consideration of all the ad hoc inputs, which over some period of time are going to create occasional incidents of coalescence. You know, these, these are linear phenomena, they add up, if you're tracking them with extraordinary precision, which I think is impractical, um, you will be able to predict when these things are going to happen. But they're going to happen at times that are completely inconvenient to you. You have no idea well enough in advance when debris is going to be coming at you. And therefore, you know, it doesn't help to be able to know precisely where the ribbon is all times because you don't have the other side. You don't know when the debris is going to be there. So you know, that's a complication. But go back now to the other side. Let's say we're, just, we're going to solve this problem by just absorbing the energy. So, Back to this moving, <laughs> moving platform. The idea is you want to catch the wave. This is what I hear all the time. Right? So you want to catch the wave. You know, if the wave is going down like this, and, then you move so that you match where it is transversely. The only problem with that is it's not quite right. The best way to absorb energy in a transverse wave is to impedance match at the bottom in a manner that's, that's analogous to resistance so that you absorb the energy. If you look at a diagram uh, which appears in many textbooks, of, of what happens if I send a wave down something and I just have a moving end that tries to just keep up with it. You know what it does? It reflects back. <laughs> Real life is very complicated. If you want to really absorb the energy, and of course it's not necessary that in all cases you absorb all of it, but if you want to absorb a substantial amount of it, the trick is you have to put exactly the right impedance on there to match the rest of the cable. How hard is that going to be from the deck of a ship on something the size of a space elevator. 
it's going to be really hard. <laughs> so all this stuff is really hard. Even simple things like, oh, we just move it, it'll you know, dissipate the energy. Or we just move it and you know, it'll avoid the debris. The details, because of all the ad hoc inputs to this, and the, just, just the fact that this thing is huge, you know, make this very hard. Is it impossible? I can't say. But is it hard? It's really hard. It's hard talking about it. It's hard writing equations for it. It's hard having conversations with people about it. I had a conversation with Jim who's sitting over here today, and he said, well, um, well, some of these things, you know, you don't have to do it perfectly. Yes, okay, well, suppose that we had, and inside of five minutes, you know, I kept coming up with, you know, yes, buts, yes, buts, yes, buts. And I didn't have to fantasize to make them up. If you imagine a piece of thread and stretch it out 40 miles, just a piece of sewing thread, and try to imagine how unstable that is in some inherent way, you know, you still haven't mapped to the potential instabilities of something the size of the space elevator. And that's been, you know, my preoccupation for a while. I think we are misled, I, and we were, or I was, initially receptive to the idea of sending a time control pulse up to avoid debris, because something in here said plot strings are classic, well understood, extremely well characterized systems. Fourier told us how to do it, and that's good enough for me, and it can be done in principle. And then I stopped there for too long before thinking about how completely intuition fails with a taught string. The biggest string I've ever taught. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, it was a good When it starts to twist, it has essentially no restoring force for how many millions of turns? Remember the rubber band airplanes? You know, you turn the propeller and the knots pile up on this. When you do that, you've got to turn the propeller. <laughs> What's the propeller? The radiation? The ballast mass. See, if you, if, you, if you don't turn the ballast mass, you're not turning the earth. Every twist you put in there has an equal and opposite twist. Sure. So and there's there's a twist. Yeah. Yeah. But but I mean, it will eventually twist. But how long it takes to restore is so far beyond your ordinary sense of ribbons. This is true. Yeah, if anybody saw Dave Lang's presentation, saw the ribbon with 